So I think um, I think we might make a start if everyone's sitting comfortably, then we'll begin. Uh, so you're very welcome to this afternoon's Irish study seminar. Uh, as usual, we've got a, a hybrid format for people here with us uh, in the Institute seminar room and people who are joining us through Teams online. So I hope you can hear hear me and uh, uh, see the slides online as well as we have the slides up in, in the room here. Uh, it's my pleasure to um, introduce today's speaker, Dr. Shona Hill. Uh, uh, who, who has until recently been um, a Marie Curie fellow, research fellow uh, in uh, drama at Queen's University Belfast, um, uh, working on the project Generational Feminisms in Contemporary Northern Ireland Performance. Um, and Shona has been publishing in that field, uh, but she's also uh, written widely on the history of women in Irish theatre. Um, and she's the author of a monograph entitled Women, um, and Embodied Mythmaking in Irish Theatre, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2019. Uh, and with her co-editor, Lisa Fitzpatrick, uh, Shona has edited plays by women in Ireland, 1926 to 33, published this year by Bloomsbury, which provides access to neglected theatrical work and broadens our understanding of the history of Irish theatre, as well as the vital role of women within it. Uh, and this is what she's going to talk to us about uh, today. Uh, so the title of Shona's presentation is Theatres of Freedom and Resistance, Women Playwrights During the Years of the Irish Free State. So Shona, over to you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you all very much for coming today. Um, I thought I'd start um, by giving you the background to this project and the anthology, which you can see the, um, the cover page from. So in 2019, I published my monograph, Women and Embodied Mythmaking in Irish Theatre. And in that, I drew together a genealogy of women's mythmaking. And one of the motivations for doing that was to um, find a way to bring the work together across the decades um, and particularly across periods when um, things had supposedly gone quiet in terms of women's theatre making. And what that meant was that drawing together this genealogy um, offered a way of countering the linear male dominated literary canon of Irish theatre. And what the, the loosely speaking, for those of you not familiar with the history of Irish theatre, loosely speaking, the, the story goes that women were very active in the revolutionary era. Um, and then it all went very quiet until second wave feminism came along and then they kind of erupted back onto the scene again. But that's not the case. There were women who were making theatre, um, but of course that begs the question, why do we, unless you're a feminist theatre scholar, why do we not know about these works? And the easy um, answer to that question is because they haven't been made available. Um, either as staged revivals or in publication. So the project, Lisa Fitzpatrick, who's at uh, University of Ulster, Lisa and I decided to work together um, to publish an anthology to bring these plays back into the um, public sphere um, for researchers, for scholars and for theatre makers to engage with. So the five plays that we chose um, from this period. Kate O'Brien's Distinguished Villa, Dorothy McArdle's Witch's Brew, Mary Manning's Youth the, Youth's the Season, Margaret O'Leary's The Woman, and Mary Devonport O'Neill's Bluebeard. The women's progress towards equality in Ireland has met and continues to meet obstacles, which, have, which has meant that not only has progress been inconsistently sustained, it has at times appeared to stall. And in terms of assembling a tradition of women's theatre, this um, stalling has threatened to undermine that process. The conservative decades of the free state is one such period, stalled period. That is the years following the establishment of 26 counties of Ireland as a dominion of the British Commonwealth. So the years of the Irish Free State, 1922 to 37, was a period in which women were increasingly struggling to be heard in the public sphere, but their theatrical work was staged. Cathy Leaney's scholarship has been um, instrumental in raising awareness of women's theatre at this time. 
And Cathy argues, from the vantage point of the 21st century, one looks back to Irish women in theatre in the 20s and 30s with sympathy and admiration for their determined survival and for their ingenious use of theatrical codes and devices to write dramas that could accommodate complex levels of meaning. The rich collection of plays in the anthology navigates these complex levels of meaning. <clears throat> Playwright Mary Manning wrote in the Gate Theatre's in-house magazine Motley, of which she was the editor. Ireland is in transition. The nation is finding its soul. New forces are at work. New ideas are crowding in upon us. Women had been integral to the events preceding the Free State's foundation from the 1913 lockout to the rising and were involved in suffrage, nationalist, labour and cultural organisations. Women's involvement continued in this period of transition and they contributed to these new ideas. I'm going to look at each of the five plays in the anthology to address this, but I want to first of all consider the context in which these women were working. So what were women and these playwrights up against? The revolutionaries had fought for full and equal citizenship as asserted in the 1960 pro 1916 Proclamation of Independence, which guaranteed religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens. Suffrage was granted to property owning women over 30 in 1918 and extended to all women over 21 in 1922. However, the promise of equality was crushed through legislation in the free state years, which restricted women's participation in the public sphere. <clears throat> in 1925, the right of women to sit civil service exams was curtailed. In 1927, the juries bill excluded women from jury service. And in 1932, the infamous marriage bar came into existence, which imposed um, a bar on female teachers and was later extended to the whole of the civil service. The capstone of these laws was, of course, the 1937 Constitution, in particular, Article 41.2, which defined woman's life within the home and granted the role of mother dominance over other models of femininity. Suffragist and nationalist Hannah Sheehy Skeffington clearly delineates between attitudes to women during the revolutionary period <coughs> versus the free state um, through comparison of James Connolly with Eamon de Valera. She says, to the one woman was an equal, a comrade, to the other, a sheltered being withdrawn to the domestic hearth, shrinking from public life. However, it's important to note, as historian Leanne Lane does, that many women, that though many women encountered obstacles, for a small minority of women, such as Dorothy McArdle, who I'll come to, class background and educational achievements mitigated these effects to some extent. So women's ability to maintain a public role was severely tested um, by the modern Irish state's predication on a highly gendered citizenship. Louise Ryan outlines several feminine archetypes <coughs> which were ut utilised as scapegoats at the time and attempted to simplify and obscure the many social and economic problems underlying the newly established state. So some of these figures include the, the modern girl with an interest in fashion and popular culture, the unmarried mother, the working woman, the emigrant woman, and women in public life, um, in politics or culture. And we see all of these figures appear in the plays in the anthology, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail. It had been thought that the foundation of the free state would curb immoral behaviour as the corrupting influence of British garrisons would be removed. However, in 1931, the Carrigan report presented evidence of rising illegitimacy rates and sexual crimes. 
which historian Maria Luddy, <coughs> excuse me, has written about. Um, she describes how the real threat to chastity and sexual morality was seen to reside in the bodies of women. And that moral regulation by church and state attempted to impose, particularly on women, standards of idealised conduct that would return the nation to purity. Fears over public morality coalesced in the figure of the unmarried mother, as well as the figure of the, quote, fag smoking, jazz dancing, lip sticking flappers. I love that quote. <laughs> as described in the newspaper, the Kilkenny people. <laughs> The efforts to restore sexual morality were endorsed through the institution of several acts um, which placed restrictions on freedom of expression. There's the Censorship of Films Act 1923, <clears throat> the 1926 Report on Evil Literature, um, which prohibited the circulation of material about contraception and abortion, and then the 1929 Censorship of Publications Act, which banned indecent or obscene books. Theatre wasn't in fact subject to a censor in Ireland. Um, it was more public opinion and self-censorship um, and the gatekeepers of cultural institutions prevailed. And we can see this actually in the plays in the anthology um, McArdle's Witch's Brew was rejected by the Abbey. And following the submission of O'Leary's wom The Woman to the Abbey, Yeats requested amendments to the ending. Playwright Theresa Devey, who isn't included in the anthology, um, but was writing at the time, she had six plays produced at the Abbey. Uh, but her play Wife to James Whelan was rejected in 1942. And apart from its production of Light Falling in 48, the Abbey ceased to support her work. In contrast, the newly established Gate Theatre took risks and staged work like Manning's use the, the use the season that was too daring for the Abbey. The purity of the nation was seen to depend on the exclusion of foreign influences. And this is articulated in the response to social dance, such as jazz, having invaded Ireland's dance halls. Um, that the dance halls being a space in which women actually had some relative freedoms. The Public Dance Halls Act of 1935 um, 35, confined dance meetings to licensed premises and imposed a government tax on admission tickets. <clears throat> the act was the result of pressure from the anti-jazz campaign, <laughs> which <laughs> you couldn't make it up really. <laughs> um, and the anti-jazz campaign was supported by the Catholic clergy and the Gaelic League, um, who highlighted the purity and authenticity of traditional Irish dancing in contrast to these supposedly corrupting foreign influences. These sentiments are captured in the Kerryman newspaper, which in 1928 dramatically asserted, the jazz spirit in everything as well as dancing is responsible for whatever decadence there is in the country. Examination of the plays in the anthology exposes the gap between the reality of women's lives and the official church and state endorsed ideal woman. Through the act of writing plays and through the presentation of the lives of the women in the plays, the playwrights reveal the reality of women's lives. And this is very neatly described by historian Marianne Valulis. Um, who says women's lives clearly transcended the single domestic dimension of the ideal constructed by ecclesiastical discourse. Increasing numbers were working outside the home, a significant number never married, women were in, emigrating increasing numbers, um, exploring their sexuality, having children outside of marriage. Women were going to dances, wearing imported fashions and going to films often enough for the complaint to be heard that they were never at home. Women were agitating for political rights, 
demanding a public identity. In essence, women were modern actors in a modernising society. In the anthology introduction, we argue that theatre offered the potential for women to explore their role as modern actors, both through employment in the theatre and through the characters presented on stage. So I want to now look at each of the plays in a bit more detail so that we can see how these archetypes and realities thread through the work. So this is the earliest um, of the plays included in the anthology, Katie Bryan's Distinguished Villa. It um, received a professional premiere on the 12th, 12th of July 1926 at the Haymarket Theatre in London. We did find a reference to a performance in the Abbey Theatre, um, but we don't think it was a professional um, production. O'Brien's probably better known as a novelist. Um, a lot of people are surprised to learn that actually this was her first literary work. Because of course she went on to have um, over five decades of success with her novels. So this, the story goes, she was working in England um, and she wrote this play as a bet. Um, and actually it turned out to be hugely successful. <laughs> She went on to write two more plays um, on a similar theme of sexual dis dissatisfaction <coughs> in the English middle class. In Distinguished Villa, O'Brien offers a detailed portrayal of the quiet misery of respectability and a realistic representation of female desire and sexuality. So the play sat in Brixton in the lower middle class family home of Natty and Mabel, um, where they live with Mabel's younger sister Gwen um, and the refined and well-educated lodger Francis Llewellyn. Two men in the play provide the love interest, John Morris, who's unhappily engaged to Gwen, um, but really suited to Francis, and Alec Webberley, who fruitlessly pursues Francis, um, but engages in a flirtation with Gwen. And I don't know how well you can see the details um, in the photo said from the production, the 20, 1926 production, um, which were reproduced in the Sketch magazine. But hopefully you can get some sense of the contrast between Mabel um, <laughs> who's obsessed with being respectable. Um, the contrast with Gwen and Francis, the younger women with their short uh, shingled haircuts and their um, modern, modern uh, fashion, their dresses. The play explores female sexuality within a realist frame and contrasts Mabel who implies that she doesn't have a physical relationship with her husband because of the physical of the delicate state of her health with her younger sister who at the play's climax is pregnant outside of marriage having slept with both John and Alec. However the work was censored by the Lord Chamberlain's office to remove Gwen's explicit explicit statement I'm going to have a baby as well as her references to her short relationship with Alec being only for fun. Gwen's pregnancy destroys the potential happiness of Francis and John. And um, when Alec refuses to admit that the pregnancy is his responsibility, and then John, believing the child to be his own, his own is forced to then marry Gwen. However, we're left in absolutely no doubt as to Gwen's fear of becoming an un unmarried mother. She says, I've always been respectable. I can't go wrong like that. Meanwhile, Natty's quiet desperation culminates in his offstage suicide in the closing scenes. Um, 
which in this image here, you can just see Mabel being protected from going into the kitchen and discovering him. Suicide's also present in two other plays in the anthology, Manning's Youth, The Season, um, as well as O'Leary's The Woman. These dark undercurrents permeate Mary Devonport O'Neill's Bluebeard, a ballet poem. This is adapted from the folk tale, which I'm sure many people know, which centres on Bluebeard's cycle of violence, whereby he murders his wives and he keeps their bodies in a bloody chamber, um, to steal Angela Carter's phrase. <coughs> his latest wife, Elena, breaks the rules and enters the lock chamber while Bluebeard is away and she's then doomed to follow the same fate. O'Neill's choice of a tale where women are punished for breaking patriarchal rules undoubtedly speaks to the conservatism and misogyny of the free state. The premiere production was included in the last programme of the Abbey School of Ballet in July 1933 and it was staged in the Peacock. Ballet and gendered violence may seem like an unlikely pairing at first glance. However, there were new and experimental cultural spaces for these conversations at the time. Against the conservatism of the period, a counterculture of experimentation was evolving. Most obviously evidenced through the establishment of the Peacock stage um, at the Abbey Theatre in 1927 and in with the Gate Theatre in 1928. I'll return to the Gate Theatre when I talk about Manning, um, but the Peacock stage was important in its embrace of experimental work, notably that of the Dublin Drama League, who introduced Irish audiences to European work. The League welcomed expressionism, and one of their regular directors, Arthur Shields, um, directed Bluebeard. Bluebeard's an important and neglected part of the history of Ireland's experimental and dance theatre, which evidences European modernist influences. <clears throat> the involvement of Nanette de Valois, who choreographed the ballet poem and danced the part of Elena, is key to this legacy. De Valois' experience as a dancer in Europe shaped her work, most notably her time at the Ballet Russe, where she encountered the work of choreographers Michel Fouquin, Leonid Mas Massine, and Bronislava Nijinska. Um, and I've included this image um, from Rout, which premiered in 1927, just to give you some sense of De Valois' choreographic style. Um, and Rout was performed in the Abbey in 1929. <clears throat> Originally, O'Neill had written Bluebeard as a verse play, which she sent, submitted to the Abbey. And it was W.B. Yeats who suggested that she revise the play um, so that it could be produced in dance form, obviously with the, um, the ballet, the Abbey Ballet School um, in mind. So in the ballet poem, um, and it's the script of the ballet poem that we've included in the anthology, um, O'Neill, she transferred the lines of Elena, um, Bluebeard's wife, and Bluebeard, um, so that they're revised as third person narration. And we just have the two narrators, Sister Anne and Cyril, and Elena and um, Bluebeard express themselves solely through um, gesture, dance, and movement. Throughout, we see the repetition of Elena's stock gesture, whereby her arms hang by her side. And together with moments of aimless movement, um, this presents her as the living dead, a fate which foreshadows the dead women of the bloody chamber. Following Elena's confrontation with the bodies of the dead wives, she runs off stage, quote, as if things had become unbearable. This is juxtaposed with O'Neill's notable addition to the folk tale, which is the defiant appearance of the ghosts of the murdered wives, 
um, who refuse their containment off stage as a chorus of voices. The final dance sees the chorus enact their fatal revenge on Bluebird, yet their collective agency is dispersed as they are, quote, scattered and crumple in the closing moments of the play. Defiance, enervation and stagnation pervade the movement of Bluebeard <clears throat> and this preempts the legacy of the free state with regards to women's cultural representation and participation. I argue that we can also see Bluebeard view view through the frame of Ireland's architecture of containment, um, which James Smith describes as encompassing an array of interdependent institutions, industrial and reformatory schools, mother and baby homes, adoption agencies, and Magdalen asylums, amongst others. So in O'Neill's play, Bluebeard's bloody chamber is the ultimate architecture of containment, <clears throat> as the threat of female sexuality and decay is contained within the beautifully preserved corpses. As the narrators chillingly tell us, six mummy women in six long boxes. The effort to resist containment threads through all of these plays. And although these efforts are stymied in Distinguished Villa and Bluebeard, Margaret O'Leary's play The Woman highlights other routes of escape, including emigration. So like O'Brien, Margaret O'Leary uses a, a three act realist structure for the setting for her family drama, which is set in rural Cork, where O'Leary was from. The play premiered in September 1929 at the Abbey Theatre and it returned to the Abbey stage later that year for a further run and also played in Cork in early 1930. And the success of the work makes it all the more confounding that the play has not received the attention or any attention aside from work that Lisa Fitzpatrick's written about the play. The action centres on the themes of marriage and land. Morris O'Hara is a farmer and a widower with two small children who's discovered to be courting Ellen Dunn, the eponymous woman. She's from a poor family and has a bad reputation. Men become obsessed by her and pine away. Morris, who cannot eat or sleep, is no exception. Another, an, an alternative wife um, for him is presented in the character of um, Kissy, a very gentle and virtuous woman, young woman. But Morris believes that Ellen was, quote, made for me from the beginning of the world. Fears over public morality clearly coalesce in the figure of Ellen, who is described both as a jade and a black eyed slut. In contrast are the evocations of the woman as nation figure. <clears throat> um, the woman as nation figure embodied in the land. Land is all important, and Morris's father tells him a dirty trick it would be to turn to turn your back on the land for the sake of a woman. The land that is more to you than a mother, the darling land. Ellen resembles the heroines of contemporaneous playwright Teresa Devey. They all long for excitement and passion, but their ambitions are entirely incongruent with their time and place. <laughs> Ellen is trapped by her poverty and her gender and her initial plans of emigration to America soon give way to thoughts of suicide and the embrace of the lake's waters. And for those of you who know the work of Marina Carr, this very clearly um, anticipates um, this sense of a mythic landscape as an alternative space of expression. O'Leary had originally submitted the play to the Abbey with a different ending. However, Yeats wrote to Lennox Robinson, stating that the ending of the play, which had the heroine Ellen leaving to wander the roads, 
would have to be changed. He said, the heroine must die and we must know she dies. All that has been built up is scattered and degraded if she doesn't come to the understanding that she seeks something life or her life can never give. Punishment through death for disobedient women is a well-worn tradition in Western theatre. Despite these obstacles, the play leaves us with an indelible impression of Ellen's defiance and resistance. I think we only need to look at this image, um, this illustration by Grace Gifford, um, which places Ellen's centre stage um, and claiming space while the others clearly physically um, recoil from her. In these plays, we need to pay close attention to the stage directions, um, which is more often where we see um, expression of the women's resistance and irrepressible corporeal energies. For example, the description of Ellen's dynamic entrance on stage in Act Two. She's very agile and moves with quick, rhythmic, feline grace. In Act Three, Ellen is seen repeatedly jumping up from her seat. Um, conveying the vitality and defiance which characterises Grace Gifford's cartoon. Ellen's refusal to be contained leads us to consideration of the theatrical forms explored by these playwrights. Through the theatre, these women playwrights carved out a space for expression which refused confinement to the role of wife and mother. And they also refused to be restrained by dominant theatrical forms, namely realism. McArdle described the lack of opportunity available to women in the free state. All life's realities seem to be shut away as though by an invisible wall. We might think of this invisible wall as the fourth wall convention of the domestic uh, convention the fourth wall confession of the domestic setting. What and who is hidden away in the private sphere and by realism? The plays collected in the anthology render these walls visible, staging their protagonists' frustration and yearning for self-determination. The urgent need to push the boundaries of space and form was articulated by Mary Manning. She said, we are going through the difficult and hazardous process of becoming a nation once again. We can never again be described as an abbey kitchen interior entirely surrounded by the bog. We could extend this metaphor further to address how women's becoming is hampered by the confines of the realist domestic space, the quote, prison house of realism, as feminist theatre scholar Sue Ellen Case describes it. In many of the plays collected here, the realist aesthetic is reshaped by influences of expressionism in use the season, the incorporation of pagan or folklore elements in Witch's Brew and Bluebeard, or innovations with genre in Distinguished Villa and The Woman. Outside spaces associated with the realm of the supernatural and folklore offer an alternative to the domestic as with the as with witch's brew and the woman. Mary Manning's experiment with theatrical form was realised in her expressionist play Use the Season, which was an early production and success for the Gate Theatre, which was established in 1928. Use the Season premiered in 1931, and it offers a searing critique of post-colonial Ireland through examination of the lives of a young, urban, educated and privileged set. It was her first play and followed by two more plays, um, both staged at the gate, Storm Over Wicklow and Happy Family. However, Use the Season was the most successful. It was revived at the gate um, in 1933, directed by Dennis Johnston, 
and produced at London's Westminster Theatre in 1937. Under the directorship of Hilton Edwards and Michal McClearmore, the Gate Theatre programmed European and experimental work as well as new Irish writing. They had notable successes with Irish plays which drew on expressionism, including Dennis Johnston's The Old Lady Says No and Manning's work. McClearmore's design for the Gate logo, which you can see here, evidences a commitment to European experimental performance both through the figure of the Harlequin, which references Nijinsky, as well as the expressionist deployment of light and shadow. The Gate offered a theatrical home to several women playwrights of the period. In addition to Manning, there was Christine Pakenham, um, Countess Longford, Lillian Davidson, who under the pseudonym Ulick Burke wrote the play Bride, and Hazel Ellis, who had two plays, Portrait in Marble and Women Without Men, both staged at the gate. Use the Season offers the perspective of a generation who have come of age following the fight for independence in the Civil War. The stark reality is that Free State Ireland offers them, quote, no scope. Societal expectations are stultifying and overwhelming. Despair, depression and death permeate their lives. For the women, there are no options beyond a passive femininity and marriage, while the men are equally restricted um, to restrict restrictive notions of masculinity, which incorporate um, the perfect city man in bowler hat, empire builder and the rugged hairy man. The, these are all types that are um, referenced as throughout the play. They are the, quote, imitation bright young people whose performances reveal the hollow masquerade of restrictive conceptions of gender, sexuality and Irishness. The mental and moral indigestion of Dublin, again, the character <laughs> Desmond's words, encumber the lives of the three central characters, Desmond, Toots and Terence. Desmond's desire to work as a designer in London is quashed as he is forced to carry on the patrilineal, patrilineal family tradition. Um, he describes working in his father's office as death in life for me. The shambling literary loafer, Terence, commits suicide in the devastating conclusion to the play, while Toots is left pleading for escape. Beneath the sparkling social comedy, the play is replete with violence and dead ends supporting the questioning title, which references the song lyrics, Youth's the season made for joy. So Manning's assertion, insertion of the question mark affirms Desmond's angry declaration that it's all a bloody lie. Exposure of the grotesque process of what Desmond describes as being buried alive depends on Manning's use of theatrical realism, theatrical expressionism, um, as evidenced in the skillfully interwoven episodes of Act Two. In this act, Desmond's birthday party is presented as a, quote, farewell to happiness and an attempt to shock the audience out of complacency. Terence's belief that, quote, this house needs to be shaken to its bourgeois foundations, resonates with Manning's annihilation of the realist domestic setting with expressionist techniques. In the premiere production, Hilton Edwards' expertise in the application of expressionist techniques in both direction and lighting enabled him to augment the fast and fluid mise-en-scene which resonated with the process of modernation that the country was undergoing. In the same year as Manning's playwriting debut, Sophie Treadwell's Machinal received its British premiere, a play which also draws on expressionist techniques to convey women's experiences of modernity. Kathy Leaney notes the influence of Noel Coward on Manning. She says, 
Remarkably, what Coward achieves with barely five pages in the vortex, Manning sustains over an entire act, and the accumulated impact unbalances the entire play. Manning's skillful deployment of social comedy with a dark undercurrent of despair is heightened by, by expressionist techniques to reveal a crisis of possibility for this younger generation. While simultaneously exploring the stage as a space of resistance against normative identities in the independent state. The play offers a challenge to the free state's coherence around gendered and sexual identity. Desmond states that, quote, I am effeminate, it's my temperament, I was born that way. A line amplified by the fact that openly gay actor McClearmore played the role in the premiere production. In Youth of the Season, this younger generation are, are described <clears throat> as, quote, raised in gunfire. This is in contrast to the eldest of the five playwrights, Dorothy McArdle, whose play, which is Brew, I'll look at now. McArdle's political involvement began in the years before the Free State. She was a Republican who participated in the War of Independence and spent a period in Kilmainham Jail. She was immersed in the political and cultural life of the Free State as a writer, teacher and journalist. And she was commissioned by her friend, Eamon de Valera, to write a history of Ireland from 1916 to 23, which was, uh, which was published in 1937 as the Irish Republic. She was an anti-treatyite and supporter of de Valera's newly formed Fianna Fáil party, which came into power in 1932. However, her support was not uncritical and she keenly felt the betrayal of revolutionary ideals, including women's equal participation. McArdle wrote to de Valera, as the constitution stands, I do not see how anyone holding advanced views on the rights of women can support it. And that is the tragic dilemma for those who have been loyal and ardent workers in the national cause. Attention to this tragic dilemma and to the threat posed by idealised femininities underlies McArdle's literary and theatrical output. <clears throat> um, and in fact, several of her plays have been recently reprinted by Tramp Press. She had her first Irish theatre production um, in 1918, which was followed by several plays at the Abbey, Atonement, and Kavanagh, and The Old Man. Cathy Leaney highlights how McArdle's Abbey plays disrupt the conventions of melodrama and the realist form, and we can see this further develop through the supernatural frame of Witch's Brew. It was submitted to the Abbey in 1929, but was rejected. However, it was published two, year late, two years later, um, but to date it hasn't received a professional production. McArdle did go on to have a play staged at the gate in 1932 called Dark Waters. However, the script to this um, has been lost. So the only records that we have are um, reviews of the production. Witch's Brew is a strange play, and it's not just because of the supernatural frame. It culminates with the reassertion of order and normative relationships, the self-sacrificing mother with her son, the dependent wife with her husband as saviour. However, this doesn't adequately smooth over the unease that has been generated, and McArdle deploys this to feminist ends. The forces of the pagan gods clash with a Christian god over Una, who is lying unconscious in the opening of the play as a storm batters the hut. Una's husband, Phelim, has gone in search of blessed water, while Phelim's mother, Anya, and his sister, Nessa, remain with Una. Anya appeals to the old gods for help before deciding to go and find Blanet, the witch girl. 
Anya returns with Blanard, who prepares her witch's brew, which, when given to Una, reanimates her. Yet the woman who's revived invokes a horrified response. Nessa shudders when she looks into Una's face. The theme of possession appears in McArdle's short collection of short stories, Earthbound. Transgressive, monstrous and unnatural women appear, feature rather, in McArdle's later work, um, notably upending expectations of who we understand to be the ideal mother in her gothic novel, The Uninvited. In Witch's Brew, Blanard is presented as both a vigorous and threatening figure, and the dangers of the potion are implicated through the reference to Koch Napool, whom we are told was revived by the brew only to murder her children. When Una is lifeless, she is described as beautiful and passive, but following her eager drinking of the brew, she refuses to conduct herself as loving daughter-in-law, sister-in-law and wife. As in O'Leary's play, women are construed to be difficult when they fail to uphold appropriate gendered behaviour. The energies of the pagan world are invoked through Blanard's striking entrance, the brew and the storm. Yet the play concludes with the blood sacrifice of the monk Kieran and assertion of Christian redemption. Una's body is once again revived from lifelessness, and this time she fulfills expecta gendered expectations. <clears throat> she speaks joyfully and lovingly as a wife. The figure of an enervated, deathly, beautiful woman resonates with Bluebeard, and as Kathy Leaney suggests, McArdle, quote, presents powerful femininity as liminal, pathological, and finally defeated. The final image of the play of everyone joined in prayer condemns Una's sinful actions. Yet, as in Bluebeard with the ghosts of the murdered wives, the thrill of unleashing repressed energies cannot be fully contained. Through explo exploitation of the uncertainty of the state between life and death, the play captures the anxieties and fears triggered during a period of transition namely between revolution and state building. Each of these playwrights worked to resist ideal models, idealised models of gender and the rules of theatrical convention. Their plays expose the gap between feminine ideals and the reality of women's lives to dramatic effect. Moreover, the act of cultural participation by these playwrights was one of defiance. To return to Leany's sympathy and admiration for their determined survival begs the question, how did they manage to survive? Theatre is a collaborative art form and the successful male playwright working in splendid isolation is a fiction which underpins the canon. Counter to this, the act of forming networks by these women in order to sustain their work is not to be underestimated. There's much more research to be done in this area. Um, I have it on my list of things to do, <laughs> but I want to close by considering one formal network for women during this period. The Women Writers Club was established in 1933 by poet Blanard Salkeld with Dorothy McArdle as chair. The network met regularly and they awarded annual prizes over the course of 25 years, including to McArdle's The Irish Republic, actually. Um, the club offered a forum to discuss wider social and political matters and its very presence asserted women's freedom of expression and their place in the public sphere. In her biography of Rosamond Jacob, um, Jacob is included in the photo here, Leanne Lane asserts the importance of the social and cultural events attended by Jacob, which offered a sense of community and an outlet for a single woman. 
These events and networks also nurtured feminist politics during a conservative period. In her history of the women's movement in Ireland, historian Linda Connolly corrects the narrative that feminism disappeared in the 20s and 30s. As she argues, a core cadre of lifelong committed feminists continue to mobilise while experiencing alienation, mar marginalisation and isolation in the post-independence period. Connolly points to abeyance organisations, which, quote, retained a structure capable of absorbing both intensely committed feminists and a much larger constituency of activists who did not necessarily refer to feminism. The Women Writers Club encompassed committed feminists in its membership, including Sheehy Skeffington and Jacob. And many of the women associated with the plays in this anthology were connected through membership of this forum, including Dorothy McArdle, Kate O'Brien, Mary Dem and Rhea Mooney, um, who performed in Bluebeard. Of the women in the photo, um, Sybil the Brocky, writing under the name Helen Staunton, was a member of the Dublin Drama League. And her play produced by the new players, was produced by the new players in the Peacock um, in passing in 1929. While poet Blanid Salkeld had a verse play staged by the Dublin Drama League at the gate, Scarecrow over Corn in 1941. Other theatrical women linked to the club include Theresa Devey, Christine Longford, Moira Laverty and Helen Waddell. The work of forging the connections between women and Irish theatre is crucial to the assembly of a women's theatrical tradition. And it's vital that we don't reimpose the silencing that they struggled against during the Free State years. This can only happen through a reframing of Irish theatre history which is something that we, myself and Lisa, hope that the anthology will contribute to. Thank you. Donna, thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful paper. Um, I'm sure there will be lots of questions uh, and we can open it up now to the, the, the floor, to people in the room and also to, to people online. So if you're joining us through Teams, and you want to ask a question, um, just press the um, reactions button uh, on your screen and um, you'll be able to digitally raise your hand just to indicate that you want to pose a question. Um, let's start. Who would like to begin? Yeah. Thank you. I don't think it was in print. Uh, before now, I don't know if anyone's been keeping volume with me. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about your um, selection process. Because obviously, <laughs> it seems a really sticky question here. Um, but obviously, there were other works by those authors that you could have chosen. And I'm wondering what kind of criteria, given that you are you know, drawing a, a narrative as you anthologize, um, or, or constructing a narrative as you anthologize, um, I'd love to know a little bit more about the criteria for selection. What didn't make the cut, uh, what, you know, as well as, as, as choices that you made in the students. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, a lot of it came down to dates and what, which of their plays fitted into the free state years. Um, and that narrowed things down an awful lot. Um, yeah, I d I'm trying to, I don't think there were any sticky questions in that respect. The only, um, thing that I would add, and I'm incredibly sad about, is that Teresa Devey isn't in the volume. Um, she was originally, um, but we were unable to get the, um, the copyright to include her. Um, although, arguably, her work is maybe better known and more accessible um, than, than these plays. Um, but yeah, it's, it, is, it is disappointing that we didn't get her in there. <laughs> Thanks. 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 Thanks.
in a more concerted way. I mean, you know, McCardle moves off into different areas, obviously, Kid of Brian um, actually becomes a, you know, as successful a novelist as she had been you know, a playwright, and then disappears as both novelist and playwright from, from any form of the canon. But D.P. is a sort of single case in point because apart from anything else, I mean, she is one of the writers who keeps the Abbey going financially through the 30s. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, it seems to be with, with, uh, with the Michael James Whelan rejection, she seems then to just hold walk away after what has been pretty much a decade of success in all sorts of ways. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just wonder about that. It is part of the reason for the, the disappearance, not just the TV, but the others as well, and the particular texts. Is it to do with just not having, um, it's not just a matter of engagement with theatres, but actually a place within the theatre? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, how many of them actually sat on boards or selection committees or you know, played some kind of managing role. What what about that aspect of their of their careers? Yeah, yeah, and the gate the gatekeeping, um, <clears throat> and I, I suppose in some ways the legacy of the Free State is <laughs> maybe it's the next volume of the anthology, but the plays that then followed is in the thirties and forties when it, I think it became even harder for women to get work staged, um, and especially in the Abbey, um, things closed down and there were more opportunities at the gate. Um, yeah, and Ter Teresa Devey's fate exemplifies that. Um, but she did, she did keep on writing. And there's a radio place, well, of course, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's one interesting part about all of, all of these women, that they were working um, in different areas. Um, Miss Devonport O'Neill is primarily known as a as a poet. Um, Derivi went Derivi Teresa <laughs> TV <laughs> went and explored different um, media, um, television as well as radio. Um, yeah, so they they really had to work hard. I'm just, I mean, sorry, that was very well, two questions. But the focus of what I was getting at, many of them actually sat on, you know, boards of theatres or board directors or artists. Right. right. Um, Do they have I any institutional know. role? I don't know. Do you know, I haven't, I haven't looked at that. That would be very interesting. Um, mm. Yeah, and presumably that information is available in the Abbey, in the archives yeah. in Galway. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> That's a great uh, paper. Thanks for really enjoying it. So, I think if you could tell me something about the um, reception um, to plays by sort of moral conservative forces, because um, it seems to me that there isn't much articulation in the public of a lot of these themes of, you know, pushback against um, notions of gender and mother and so on. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, do they sort of fly under the radar a bit because it's theatre, you know, and the theatre is maybe seen as something more. A more elite art form compared to you know, huge anxieties about film and, and dance halls and so on. So I'm just wondering where it fits into that sort of um, atmosphere of moral censorship. And then connected to that, I'm, I'm wondering, in, you know, you're, I think it's, it, these plays are really interesting and seen them as a kind of a resistance to a kind of moral conservatism. But you know, what's the significance of that resistance in terms of, you know, does it have any kind of impact beyond quite small circles of? you know, middle class, very highly educated um, people, because it's interesting that it is, you suggest sort of closed down almost completely by the 40s, which suggests that, is, is that, that even the, this articulation is seen as a kind of a threat that needs to be kind of um, quashed. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I think we have to remember as well, it's, I think the answer to your second question is that this, the ripple effect as well. Um, and I'm only talking about the playwrights involved in these plays, but of course there's a whole, talk about that idea of networks, there's a whole network of other women involved um, acting, um, fantastic sets, um, designers working at the time. Um, so I think all of that has to come into that equation um, and the kind of the, 
yeah, the ripple effect of that pushback. Um, <clears throat> I forgot now what your first uh, question was. Whether moral conservatives got oh, yeah. about, you know, these yeah. superior public. Um, yeah, there, funny, that's something um, that we noticed with the um, the reviews of these plays. Um, <laughs> my reading of the plays, um, what I'm seeing in the plays is not um, what's reflected in the review. It's almost like it's kind of gone over their heads almost. They're kind of oblivious um, to the, the, the resistance that's there. Um, but I suppose to talk about that, that the, the, the effect, um, that's, that's just the reviewers, kind of other gatekeepers in a sense. Um, but that's not necessarily what um, different audience members got from the play. You know, they they other, other women could have been to these performances and been um, galvanised, outraged. But we don't know. That's not in the reviews. It's interesting because this is a period, you know, when when novels and films are being actually starred for anything that reeks of, you know, Something that's not aligned with Catholic morality. So it's interesting that yeah. theatre seems to maybe slightly escape that. Yeah. And then the fact that there wasn't an official censor yeah. or the gate. And it's 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 funny that the, the one play that falls foul of a censor is O'Brien's play because it was performed in London. I mean, that's the custom of history of our station, that there is no equivalent to So the mm. Catholic can speak of censorship, speak of is bad. I think it's a kind of oversight that we just run through. The, the, you know, film is a new medium, they have to control that. But theatre, the lots of media there. I think that, I think that's very important. Yeah, sure, go ahead. It's just, um, I think it's embarrassing um, about seeing this play, play played by the Western world 20 years or so before that, before these plays. And there was riots and all over the papers about how horrific that was because one woman came on stage wearing a shift. Right. And it was hell and all in the country and everything. It was just like ter terrible, terrible. But because women were being um, not treated very well on stage, everyone stayed by. You know? And um, I just wondered if people, if they were in the audience, was, was there ever any going or no one would think what's going on on stage? And there's nothing in the press, I don't think. I mean, no, I, right. yeah, mm -hmm. I haven't come across um, mm -hmm. anything like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And actually, most of these plays, the ones that were staged, were, um, like you say, like DV, good box office revenue. Yes. Um, Manning was as well. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'm wondering about the photo that's on screen right now, actually, um, and the men in the photo. Uh, it's interesting to me because you were talking about the Women Writers Club being like a sort of safe haven to express very radical ideals for the period. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering if you could maybe say a little bit more about who these men are, if you know anything about them. And like, they must have been significant enough to be pictured next to these very important writers. Um, and it's like, what was that dynamic like between them? Were they were they just there like essentially helping out administrative roles, or were they? Because I don't know. It just seems like a category of mistake. Yeah, I. I don't know okay. anything about them, but funnily, um, the names listed here, um, <laughs> some of the names, the names that aren't there are the men. <laughs> yeah, and the, the first yeah. man is just a question mark. I suppose it says a lot. <laughs> yeah, so I guess they're, yeah, not very important. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Sorry, if you have a question. Yeah, I did. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, you know, I suppose, um, I suppose, 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 I suppose
Well, for me, super, super exciting to see you engaging with dance and engaging with the dance history. And so wonderful to have Bluebird written about and thought about um, and Annette Valwa. And I guess, you know, in parallel um, to that history, we, we see it, it's such a similar pattern happening with dance. So we have the amazing Irina Brady coming over as a Holocaust um, refugee, setting up her art and her dance, uh, her modern dance workshop and all of this and doing this incredible work. And then we have her writing a letter uh, at the end of her early 40s saying, this country has killed me. I have to get out. <laughs> and she just can't hack it anymore. You know, she just has to run for the hills. It's just so oppressive come the 40s. So it's so interesting that we have this Parallel, I think she had Jacqueline Robinson going out and doing dance classes in convents and schools, also in rural locations. And at some point, Jacqueline Robinson reports that the nuns are telling her that they can't do second position plies anymore. So that's where you have your legs in a in a wider stance and you bend your knees, that that's just absolutely improper and that's not possible anymore. So we have this narrowing and narrowing and narrowing and we seem to have this incredibly fertile period mm. with Yates. And here comes my question. So Yates, when I looked back, so as a feminist, when I was looking at all of that history and kind of being a bit grumpy about there being this literary canon populated by men, where are the women? We know they're there digging in, found all these incredible women, and Mishio Ito, you know, people that are mm. that are coming in, you know, the Japanese no dancer that worked with Yates on his dance place. All of these fabulous people that, as you say, you know, have the European influence are coming in, bringing all of this really interesting new stuff into the scene. Um, but Yates has this other side, and you seem to be sort of cloaked in like this slightly sensorial voice, mm. this kind of you know, coming in and saying, no, the ending has to be this. So we'd just love to hear a little bit more about that, because on the one hand, he seems to facilitate things in a really positive manner that, you know, bringing this experimental stuff to the fore and also championing female writers. And on the other hand, he was such, a, you know, a, a, a presence and a voice and, a, and, a, and, mm -hmm. and you seem to be hinting at kind of having this kind of sensorial power. Yeah. 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 That's really true. I actually hadn't thought of it like that, but yeah. you're so right. Um, I wonder, is it with the Abbey School of Ballet, though, <laughs> is it because it's it's his baby <laughs> in a sense that, yeah. yeah. We're in it. Mm. Yeah. So they met on the circuit in England and he met her and thought, uh, she can be the, you know, the person who I can, after Michio, she left him or he went to speak and up in the tournament front, but thought that she could be then the person who could take on his dance place and further them. And that's why we brought her back essentially and then her role grew. Mm -hmm. And she was then the founder of the Abbey School of Ballet. But as her career took off in England and she was working with the Cambridge right. Festivals, but then the Royal Ballet was eventually going to become the Royal Ballet. Um, she had less and less time. So she was going back and forth and back and forth, but her presence was lessening and weakening mm -hmm. as the years went on. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's such an interesting relationship. And and of course, then we know the demise, the demise of the Abbey School of Ballet. And the, I, and I yeah. think that had also a huge effect that you're, you're charging here in the, the lessening of, of experimental work. You know, we see less experiment happening yeah. um, after the Abbey School of Ballet shuts down. Yeah. And, and Bluebeard, that was the final exactly, programme exactly, for the exactly Ballet exactly School. Program. Yeah. And it's so fascinating because there are like the brilliant work that you're doing uncovering that. And there's, there's all the other stuff like the, um, the tuberculosis ballet, there's all of these fabulously weird productions <laughs> that were a mix of poetry and dance and theatre and all yeah. of this, you know, this incredible experimental work going on at the time. Yeah. And then it just disappears into domesticity. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I included the image from Rout, because yeah. I think it's quite surprising. Yeah. We kind of make this assumption that something is kind of exciting and out there is that couldn't possibly have ever been on the Abbey stage, but you know it was. <laughs> so I have a question typed into the um, into the chat here uh, online. Uh, there was a recent production of Villa, I think, uh, at the 
Binborough Theatre London too. recently. What chance of further performances of these works that you've been told? <laughs> that's <laughs> that's the dream. Yeah. It's, I I would yeah I would really love to see. I just love to I well personally I would love to see these on stage. Yeah. Um, not just because I want to see women's work staged, but they're really good plays that really deserve to be staged. Um, I didn't, funnily, we didn't know about the production of Distinguished Villa when we were working on the anthology. That was a couple of weeks ago, I think, um, in London, which I didn't get to see. Um, yeah, it would be, it would be great. Um, we, uh, we had the launch for the anthology in the Abbey Theatre, so we tried to <laughs> land a few seats. <laughs> Good. Um, so any more questions? I mean, if there's anyone um, out there on the um, in Teams who's been trying to get through, can't raise your hand, just you can unmute yourself and ask your question now. Break that pause while we wait. <laughs> Or anybody else in the room wants to ask a question? Yeah, go on, Eamon. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it is, I mean, I know it's a fact we're putting together an anthology that we're trying to represent for those forms of writing, uh, where they form the drama fair, uh, you know, our table of bullet points, you know, like dance theatre and so on. So one of the, I mean, one of the things that does strike me is that, I mean, if, you know, if I, if I look at your bunch of distinguished bill for instance, it's, that is obviously heavily influenced by Ibsen, the influence on the, 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 the writers of the reliable period. Um, and in general terms, I think one of the things that happens to Irish theatre is that it becomes a writer's theatre. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, the, one of the odd things then about the, the, the playwrights you're talking about, the particular plays you're talking about, is that insofar as they are writer and drama, mm. you know, the, the chance of survival should have been stronger. Yeah, yes. Yeah. You know, if you look at the stuff that's excluded, and it's, I mean, Dennis Johnson yeah. mentioned a couple of times because of the games he plays with theatre. Right. Um, you know, his, you know, his work just falls out of view, despite its excellence. <laughs> but I, I just wonder about that sense of then the, the was there a sense of some of them trying to conform to the, the dominant forms of drama? This is what I'm asking. I don't think they were trying to conform, but I think they were aware of the kind of the weight of authority of mm. being the writer, the playwright. Um, and I mean, that's where the, the Women's Writers Club, I guess, comes in as well, because it kind of is adding weight yeah. to that. Um, it's kind of part of that struggle to assert themselves. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, why the woman? I mean, it looks, it just sits so well with all the other theatre and how is it not yes, know, on syllabuses of Irish theatre and in you kind know, of anthologies that are published? It's astonishing. Yeah. Okay, well, look, thank you very much, everyone, for joining this, joining us this afternoon, and and thanks particularly to Shona uh, for for coming and sharing with us um, her research and, and bringing back into the limelight, if that's the right term, <laughs> these, these very important uh, texts which have been long overlooked and, and long forgotten, uh, and also for um, contextualising them so so persuasively and so effectively this afternoon and, and per, uh, arguing for their continuing importance. So can we perhaps finish just by thanking Shona in the traditional way of the round of applause?